Hey guys, you're listening to the third episode of Elevated DIY with Brian Barney, and and today on the podcast I've got a guest, Lane Walter, and uh, Lane was my videographer on this Wyoming backcountry bow hunt. Uh, he's just got a great knowledge of photography and videography, and, and then he's a good bow hunter too. Um, he's done a, a bunch of filming for Outback Outdoors, and then he's also got a couple films that he's done for the Full Draw Film Festival. So we'll get this thing rolling here. Hey, Lane, how's it going? Good, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing good. Well, yeah, thanks for being on here today and doing this with me. This is great. We finally got all hooked up. Sweet, yeah. So as you got home and you've been busy, it looks like uh, you and your wife uh, put down a good mule deer, huh? Yeah, I wouldn't say me and my wife. I'd say my wife did it. I was at home babysitting the kids, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, she sounds like quite the killer. Yeah, she uh, she definitely got more animals under her belt than I do, to be honest with you. I think when we started dating, she was at like her seventeenth elk, and I was at my zero. <laughs> So, oh, that's crazy! Wow, huh? Good for her. Yeah, she uh, she grew up right. Her dad had her do a lot of the youth hunts and stuff, and yeah, she's a killer. Oh, right on. Well, yeah, we just got done with that Wyoming hunt. That was a pretty cool hunt, wasn't it? Oh, dude, it was awesome. It was my first time doing a high country mule deer hunt like that, and I am I'm addicted, dude. It was a blast. I had a great time. Oh, right on yeah so did i that was so killer up and through there well yeah no we we did good and boy i think we captured some really good footage up there too man i hope so i it was looking great on the on the camera when i was taking it and i hope it all turns out the way it was looking because it was just and in that country it's hard to take bad video i think it's just so beautiful so yeah absolutely no it was epic i i put it all on my computer and then i had to ship everything off to eastman's for that gal to go through it or whatnot and and uh yeah no everything i put on my computer was absolutely awesome and tons of footage so i think we did good i think we captured the hunt i can't wait for it to to be edited and put out there so now it's just the long wait right you're used to that exactly oh yeah i'm used to doing it and then waiting six months to a year and then be like oh hey this is on so it's pretty awesome yeah, good for you. And so you've done a lot of filming for Outback Outdoors, and then um, well, what other type of filming have you done? I've done some personal projects. Uh, I got a project in the uh, Full Draft Film Tour this year, which is called Thriving Above 12K. And then I filmed another film that's in there for Whale Tail Outdoors, which is uh, Into the Canyon, and that was a bighorn sheep hunt that he took with his trad bow. Oh, man. Awesome. So you've had some awesome hunts that you've gone along on with uh, the trad bow for a sheep. That had to be unreal. Oh, dude, it was awesome. I was just there at the right day. Uh, I actually met this guy that runs that John Bielik through Train to Hunt and his brother Cole and John had the tag and he mentioned it and I had the bug for sheep hunt and I said, hey, if you need a cameraman to, to hang out and his brother Cole ended up having to work. So he was down a cameraman. And I got to go with and was with him during the kill. It was just an awesome hunt, man. And to get that close for him to do with the trad, it was, it was really cool. Oh, dude. Unreal. How close did he get? Uh, well, for a trad bow, I would say he was far away. It was like a 35 yard shot, but he just drilled the thing. So it was awesome. Okay. Yeah. Which is close for a compound or close for anybody, but boy, those guys get pretty good at those things, don't they? Oh man. It's ridiculous seeing those guys. That's something I want to pick up when I want to start messing with, but it's going to be a long time before I trust myself to actually go out and shoot something with it. Unless it's, it's a beat. Yeah. It's a ton of practice, isn't it? I, I've been messing around with mine more and more and I, I really want to get a kill under my belt with it. And so I've been practicing a bunch where I feel good out to a close yardage, but it, it's still nowhere near a compound yardage. That's for sure. Exactly. I think for me, my distance right now would be 10 yards. If I could get something to 10 yards, I'd shoot a cow and I'd be acting like it was a 400 class bull. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm closer to 20, but yeah, I'm still not over 20. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> like I said, 10 yards for me would be my max. Like if I had a 400 class bull at 20 yards, I probably wouldn't pull it back and shoot. I <laughs> I'd just let it walk because I wouldn't trust myself with it. I hear you. No, I'm the same way. Yeah, the, uh, if you can't make the shot, you know, with any bow, there's no need in taking it. That's for sure. Exactly. I had a really good buddy tell me that if you shoot and you're hoping to hit it, then that's too far of a shot for you. Whether it's five <laughs> yards or fifty yards or twenty yards, if you're hoping to hit it, then you did something wrong. You should shoot and be. If you missed, you got to be surprised you missed. 
Yep, that's a good way to put it. I like that for sure. So you must be doing double duty today. I can hear the little one in the background, huh? Yeah, he's been quiet up until now, but now he hears Dad talking. He's he's doing a little bit of squawking, so sorry about that. Uh, no worries. He, he's adding in where he wants to. No, that's great. No, I just appreciate you being on with me. And like I say, our, both our schedules have been so busy, so I'm just glad it worked out. Yeah, you and me both. I'm really happy to talk to you again before you head up to Alaska, man. Yes, I'm super excited. So you just got back from Alaska, huh? We talked a lot about that hunt on our hunt when we were in Wyoming there, but you went for caribou in Alaska there? Yeah, I went uh, northeast of Anchorage, and it was just a really, really awesome hunt, man. We got flown in about 100, 100 miles away from anything, any roads, anything, and it was just so awesome to be that far away, that disconnected from everything, and just be covered up in the Alaskan wilderness. It was, I loved every minute of it. Yeah, man, for sure. And you guys killed some awesome caribou, right? And you went with a pretty good group of buddies? Yeah, I went with a great group of guys. I went with my father-in-law and one of his really good buddies and then a mutual friend of ours from California, Mike, and then my brother-in-law, my so my sister's, or my wife's sister's husband, Greg, went with us. So it was a good group of five guys, and three of them killed out that first 24 hours they were allowed to hunt because in Alaska you got to wait 24 hours and then you can start hunting. So in that first 24 hours, three guys had caribou down. And that was up to Mike and I. We had a little bit more pressure on us, and we had to go a little bit further than they did, but we got her done on the fifth day. It was awesome. Man, yeah, good for you guys. And they were all just giant caribous looking over, looking over the picture, right? Giant bulls? Yeah, I, I still don't know a ton about judging caribou. Like, I know what a 400-inch bull looks like, and none of us killed a 400-inch bull, but I just went there saying, if I can shoot something, I know what would look good to me, and I definitely surpa- surpassed that goal of getting something that looks good and looks great to me. I... I went above and beyond. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, and I don't quite know how to judge them either, but, um, man, they sure looked 400 if they were an inch. Those things look like giants to me, just huge tops, and and, and then uh, the shovels look good on them, and they, they sure look big beamed, and, man, they just look like giant ones to me. So good for you guys. Oh, it was awesome, and we definitely didn't kill the biggest ones we saw. We saw a couple of them that just made ours look small. It was crazy. Just the genetic pool up there is just insane. So is it like they say where they're just rolling through country all the time and, and some of the bigger ones you can't kill because you just can't get close to them or cut them off and they're there and gone before you get a chance? Well, we got there right on the 15th of August and we started hunting on the 17th. And it was they were just starting to do their migration. So when we got there, we were covered up in them for two days and then they seemed to be gone for two days and then they were back for that fifth day. So, yeah, it was it was crazy. We were seeing different caribou every day. We we had one big bull that we saw for two days in a row, and then he was gone. But other than that, they were just continually moving. It was really cool. Huh, right on. Yeah, good for you guys. So um, your wife's here, um, you guys, she got it done on that, so she was solo on that deal and uh, uh, able to sneak in and get a good shot on him. I know she, was, she really wanted to fill that tag, right? She's been hunting pretty hard for it. Yeah, her dad actually was able to break away from work and go with her and, and hang out, but she was able to sneak up to 80 yards, and she had a bedded butt just staring right at her. And I'm pretty confident with her bow, and he was bedded, so she took a shot and just center punched him, which for a lot of people, that'd be far but she just center punched the thing and he didn't even know what happened. And it took him a couple minutes and he stood up and she hit him again and he went right down. So yeah, she was really happy with that. Oh, good for her. Congratulations to her. I know she was covering for you the, the whole time you were caribou hunting and then, and then for my hunt, when you were filming, I know she was covering for you, you know? So yeah, good for her. I'm really happy she got it done. Oh yeah. So was I, cause now I get to go elk hunting. So <laughs> <laughs> something. Yeah, good for you. So you're heading elk hunting, starting to plan your trip, huh? I'm starting to plan my trip. I'm actually going to leave Sunday night. I got a buddy that's got a trophy tag here in Colorado. It took him 15 years to draw Unit 61. And if he doesn't tag out by Sunday night, I'm heading out Sunday night to go hunt with him. But if he tags out before then, I'm going to be going up with my father-in-law. And then next week, I'm going up for as long as the wife gives me the whole hall pass. I'll be gone Monday through Sunday or until we all tag out. So. <laughs> Oh, good for you guys. And then um, 
So yeah, that's a good thing to talk about right now, just because everybody's kind of getting into elk season and elk hunting. And I know you've been really successful elk hunting, and you were saying last year that your whole party filled out on bulls all on public land, right? Like five or six of you? It was, we were nine for nine on public land bulls. Oh, wow. Nine for nine. Was, good for you guys. And then if you throw in Dave Baronio's hunt that I filmed right before that, then we were, I was 10 for 10 on my elk hunts. Oh, wow. Huh, that's unreal. And you said it was a, a tough season there. A lot of guys were saying it was a tough season, right? And it was, man. Where I was hunting with Dave, we were just literally probably 15 miles to the south, southeast of where I was hunting. And on private land, and it was just completely different. They weren't responding to the calls, and they, these guys hadn't even been pressured. So it was it was kind of a crazy off year, but in our little honey hole where we were at that year, it was just ridiculous. So hopefully we can have a repeat, and I'd be happy with half that success rate. Going from 100% to 50%, I'd totally be happy. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no, that's great success. So what do you think the key is to your guys' success in there? You think it's a spot you've just hunted years after years and kind of learned, you know, the their patterns and movements or their, their calling or the way you adapt? Or what would you say that was the key to your success there? I think the main part would be my father-in-law. He's just a straight-up killer. And whenever he's with, it seems like he's taking to the horses because he knows he, somebody's going to be taking something down. And then, yeah, a combination of just knowing the area and knowing what the animals do when they get pressure. If there's other hunters in there, then we know where they're going to be moving to, and we got to work a little bit harder, whereas these other guys aren't. And it's a spot that we've been hunting for five years now, so we've gotten, we've gotten pretty comfortable with it, done a lot of scouting trips in there, and just knowing what the animals do under pressure. Because when you're hunting public land, it, it seems like you can't find any bulls that aren't pressured anymore. And so knowing how to respond to them, knowing how to call them in, knowing how when to call, when not to call, I think we just got that specific herd figured out. If I were to go apply those tactics somewhere else, it probably wouldn't be as successful. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. No, that's, uh, that's so interesting. So you know when the pressure gets in there in those different basins and bowls, you kind of know where those elk go to get away from the pressure, different little hideaways or, or hidey holes and basins where they go. So then you guys just travel a little bit further to these out-of-the-way spots. Exactly, and we get off the trail a little bit because that's what it seems what they do. There's a lot of their natural trails in there that we go in on. But then as soon as they start getting pressure, they stop using those trails and they get into the nast, nasty, thickest, downfall stuff ever. And that's where we usually end up finding them once, we, once they've been pressured. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so interesting. Right on. So you just go to the, the tougher to get to spots. And then how would you say you call it those pressured bulls since they've heard a call there? Like, like what would be a normal sequence for you guys? Uh, a lot of cow calling versus the bugling. I'll, uh, I might do a locate bugle first thing in the morning, see where the bulls are at and start hiking in. But after that, I'm really light on the cow call. Not a ton of cow calling whatsoever, but just and a really minimalistic on the bugling. Because those things, man, it seems like you can have the best bugle ever, and they will. They usually shut up after the first hour and a half of light, and mm -hmm. then they're even during the full rut, they're not screaming that much. And really light on the cow call, but just doing it just enough. We'll sit there and I'll I'll blow on the call for ten to twenty seconds, then I'll stop for about five to ten minutes and just wait, and then do it again. Because it seems like if I'm doing anything more than once every five minutes, they're not coming into it. Man, isn't that the truth? I just did a, I just finished up a podcast where I did tips and tactics and I said that was the number one thing is to not call too much. They seem to know that you're human or they don't want to come in once you start calling too much or too often at them or if you're, you're calling in the wrong times of the day. So that's great to hear from, from somebody else that's successful on them that, that you call really sparingly on them. And it's funny, last year, doing that same tactic, it worked great, and I had this cow come in, and she didn't shut up for two minutes straight. The whole time, it was mew, 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 and I got video of her walking up to my buddy Darren at like five feet. And she's mewing the whole time, and a bull came into her. It wasn't my call, and it came into her just nonstop mewing, and he shot it. But if that had been me nonstop mewing, I guarantee you, you wouldn't have come in. <laughs> yeah, that's the best decoy you can get when you get a live cow in there mewing next to you. It doesn't get any better than that. Oh, it was ridiculous. The bull came in and saw her and didn't even see my buddy between them. So, <laughs> perfect broadside 10-yard shot. <laughs> oh, right on. Good for you guys. 
Um, so when you're making those cow calls, do you do like a lot of cow and calf sounds or do you do like a lot of uh, whiny estrus cow calls or what do you like to do? Personally, I like to lean more towards the whiny, nasally estrus cow calls and really draw it out. I'll throw a calf call in there every once in a while just to change it up. But for me, it's mostly that if I'm hunting it in the right spot, it's that nasally estrus cow call. Yeah, that's that same call I use, really drawn out, just that, ew, 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 you know, that really long estrus cow call that seems to be what they answer, what they like for me, too. Exactly, and I don't know about you for your call sequence, but I have to mentally think about changing it up, or I'll do the exact same thing all day long. It'll be like the mew, 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 like that same four to five calls every single time unless I mentally tell myself, hey, you got to change this up a little bit. Yeah, that's a good tip too. I find myself doing that too because you get kind of your sequence that you like or that Bull's answer to and then you just start doing that sequence over and over and then and then you sound like a robot. You know, that doesn't sound right either. No, that's a good tip. You change it up as you're calling. That's so killer, huh? Yeah, good for you guys. Well, yeah, no, I bet you're looking forward to getting in the elk woods and chasing around. Your date should be pretty good, huh? Yeah, I am I strongly believe in Colorado the best week to hunt is the last week. And so I'm really excited that that's when I actually get up in there. It sucks waiting that long to go up and do it, but I'm, I'm really excited for it. Yep, and so that last week in September, or that last week in Colorado, what are the dates? Of this? Is that like the third week of September or the last week in September? It's or? usually the last week in September. Um, this year it lines up to where it's the second to last week in September. But, okay. Yeah, yeah it's always I was ending around like the 25th. Yep, that's what I've always said is the peak of the rut around here is 15th to the 25th are like the best dates you can get. But, um, I, you know, I don't mind hunting October, early September. It's just a different set of tactics. But, yeah, that 15th to the 25th, those would be great dates for you guys. Yeah, I'm really excited to get up there and do it. It's always panned out for me in the past. So. Yeah, good for you guys. You got the same group of guys going this year? Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, none of us drew the spot that we go to. We usually draw it within, uh, with about 70% of the time, and none of the guys drew it. So we're going to be going to a different um, different spot that's over the counter and a little bit further back in there. I think we're going to have some good success in there. We've had good success in there in the past, and we haven't touched it for three or four years, but I'm excited to get back in there and check it out. Good. You got your uh, father-in-law all in line with the horses, I bet, huh? Yeah, this spot's hard to get the horses into, but uh, my father-in-law hates packing mine on his back, so I think he's going to figure out a way to get the horses in. <laughs> okay, so uh, you guys got to, like, cut your trail in there because of downfall trees and that? or Exactly. We start out on a trail, but we're only on the trail for about two to three miles, and then we'll go another four or five off the trail. we got a really good elk trail that's beaten in off in this line. The trail itself curves and goes up to the south or down to the south, and then we actually just keep going east on it. So Okay. Take some game trails in that and try to keep on those as you're going through the timber? Exactly. Exactly. It's just a really good game trail that's beaten in that you can take horses on. Just worry about a down log that you haven't seen, and since we haven't been in there in a few years, that's what our main concern is some, some downfall, because there is a lot of downfall in this area with Colorado. We had the pine beetle move through about... 10 years ago and now we're just really paying for it with all the downfall okay gotcha Mm -hmm. well yeah good for you guys that should be a great hunt well uh, um yeah so uh, and the main reason not the main reason or one of the reasons i wanted to get you on here lane is you are so good with a camera in your hands whether it's filming or whether it's uh uh uh, taking pictures, support photos, and harvest photos. And so I wanted to get into that just a little bit, just about um, filming hunts and the shots you take and kind of the the gear you use and your approach at it. I thought it was great. You kept me on task the whole time with uh, interviews and then your, your B-roll, your support footage was just so good. But what kind of mindset do you have going into these hunts um, when you're filming them? First of all, thanks for the kind words, man. I It's something I've I really have a passion for and to see it actually panning out and and coming through and showing them my work. It means a lot to hear from guys like you that say that it looks really good. So, and you're back in that country. So hearing somebody say that's seen the country in person, say that it looks good. It's, it's always hard to capture on film. So thanks for that. 
Yeah, no worries. No, you deserve every bit of it. Like I say, I, I couldn't have asked for a better team member in there. Gosh, I thought we worked really good together and, and able to capture things. But, um, yeah, just your vision on diff- different shots. Like the um, you're always getting different landscape in your shots, and you seem to get um, – you seem to film everything from start to finish, from the pack end to uh, setting up our camp to seeing bucks and glass in and, and just the whole thing along. But I really like like some of the shots shots you add in that sun shot that i posted that one was so awesome when you got that sun that was coming up when i was glassing right there i'll always remember that one and and then other shots too like i like that close-up shot that you got like of our feet when we were hiking and slipping in the gravel in that i think that'll edit in there really killer too i hope so i so a lot of those shots are i get into my mindset that my good buddy jordan brown and dustin etheridge they do a lot of filming with me we called our artsy fartsy side and <laughs> it's funny being a guy you know that hunts a lot and i'm a firefighter and you think lifting weights and the, a lot of like i don't know what guys would call manly things and then my favorite mindset to get into it seems like is the artsy fartsy side yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's like me too. Uh, uh, when I'm in there hunting too, you gotta almost switch on your your art side to get those good support shots and those those good shots that nobody else thinks of. Yeah, and Dustin and uh, Trevin have done a great job of teaching me how to get everything framed up to where it looks good when you're doing it. So you're getting the artsy fartsy out, and you're making it to where it aesthetically looks good for the viewer's eye. Because anybody can pick up a camera nowadays and go back in there, put it on automatic. But if you're not framing it right, it just looks off when you're watching it. And getting into that mindset, I've read a few books on it and how to get everything framed correctly. Because that's always my, personally, my been my hardest thing is getting everything framed right. But now I think I'm getting in that mindset to where... I can, for the most part, I get my shots framed to where everything looks good and I'm capturing what I want to capture, but I'm doing it to a way that it's aesthetically pleasing to everybody when they're watching it. Okay, so when you say get it framed right, are you talking about perspective or, or what do you do when you're trying to get a shot framed right? Exactly. I think one of the, uh, the best ways to describe it is somebody sitting there glassing. I'll almost never have them in the center of my picture. I'm going to have them on the back side so that where they're looking i can see as much of the field of view that they're looking towards as possible if i'm making that sound right so if they're looking from right to left then i'm going to have them on the right side of the frame so that their binoculars are pointed out to where they're looking and i have all that in my in my frame so that they can see what they're so that it just it looks better than if i were to have you in the middle and i can see behind you because you're not no, that- looking behind you you're looking in front of you so i'm going to put everything in frame that's in front of you yeah, it makes total sense. So you're showing the person that's glassing, and then you're showing what they're glassing or what they're looking at. So, so the audience, whether you know you're filming or you're taking support pictures, I think that's a great tip to to show that country and landscape that that they're looking at. Um, help helps make the picture, and so that's what you mean when you're talking framing the shot. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Oh man, way cool. Um, yeah, I just learned a ton about uh, video work when I was with you, and so yeah, I wanted to touch on that. And then what what camera did you use to film? You like using the DSLRs to to film these hunts, right? I like using a DSLR in full manual mode because I can just push it so much further than I can in a camera that's more automatic. I can't control the light settings as much. I can control the focus, but the light is what I really like to push, and I like to push my field of view. And so for me, the DSLR, that's what I'm really comfortable with to be able to push it to where if I need a a really deep field of view, I can do that. If I want a really shallow one, I can do that with it a lot easier on those automatic than I can on an automatic camera. And so I like using the Canon products, and that's what I was shooting out there was a Canon 6D. And my main lens was just that 24 to 105 L series. It's just such an awesome lens. And for being what, quote unquote, a kit lens, it's still L series lens for people that know what I'm talking about on it which means it's just their highest quality lens that they make. It's just an awesome lens. I love using it. The only thing I wish I could have a lower f-stop on it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, with uh, guys out there, they're, you know, hopefully if they're, they're listening or picking up tips, hopefully there's some successful guys out there. What would you say would be your number one tip, like on harvest photos, what guys can do to make better harvest photos? Well, for that, but- I love taking harvest photos, if you couldn't tell when we were doing it. <laughs> Most of the time when I'm with my buddies, they have to tell me to stop so we can actually get back to work and getting it cleaned up. 
Uh, just getting it framed right. That's the I, the biggest thing when I see people with these animals, and you know it's a big bull. But, man, you can always make something look bigger. You can always make the deer look better if it's framed right. If you can get that thing skyline, get yourself out from behind the antlers to where you're off the side to where everything looks bigger and is out in front of you, framing it that way is always going to make it look bigger than if you're between it or if you have brush behind the antlers to where you it kind of just blocks your field, your field of view, even though it's there. It's just going to camouflage it in. Yep. Yeah, and thanks a bunch for my harvest photos. God, you took some awesome ones of that mule deer up there. They turned out really good. But, yeah, I'd, I'd say along with that, too, is just, um, you know, I like to set that animal up to where he looks like he's naturally laying there, you know, and, and set his legs up. And, and then I like to clean him up and get as much blood off as I can. You know, those simple things. And then, like you say, framing those horns skyline, man, that always makes them look good. And, and also play around with tipping the head and different directions you know sometimes the nose looks better you know all the way down if he's got big backs you know to show off his big backs or like with a bull sometimes you kill a a great big bull and he's got really big fronts and not so much you know not such big backs to where you know you want to take that angle of the best feature and the best characteristic of that animal you killed exactly you you touched on something i just skipped right over because it's just so natural to me with it but getting all that blood off making the animal look as natural as possible. I'm always going to clean it up. I always try, whether it's a perfect kill shot or not, I always try to put a bow or something. That's when I'll put a pack in the, the cover up where the, the wound is. I'll try to always get as much blood as possible, just show as much respect for the animal as possible. And then tilting that head to get the angle right. Like you said, there's just different animals have different characteristics and not every angle is going to look great on every animal. And Sometimes it's just a little tilt, just like a quarter of an inch, makes all the difference in the picture. Oh, man, absolutely. Yep, for sure. And and like you say, I mean, there's blood when you're hunting, but when you're taking a harvest photo, like you say, you're trying to do that animal as much respect as you can. And I always say, like, you want it magazine quality. And I was always shooting for the magazines, and so I always wanted to make them as clean as possible. But it just makes such a nice harvest photo when you clean them up like that, you, you get your animal set up, you find the right angle on them, and then to take those shots. And then... And then I, I think a good tip would be to take um, more pictures. Like you were saying, your friends have to stop you from taking pictures. I think that's a great tip, too, because not every picture is going to turn out. And, and so, you know, I think you must have taken probably close to 100 pictures of that deer I killed, right? Probably, yeah. Yep. If the bat and wasn't it, dying, I would have taken more. <laughs> yeah, and I'd say, you know, I'm probably in between 50 and 100 when I kill an animal, too. They just don't all turn out and the more you can get you can never take more you know once you get home and you get looking over the computer and something isn't right on it but but yeah taking enough shots to where you've got enough to choose from you know different angles and, and different shots of that deer i think is a really good tip yeah I'm, exactly i'm fine hiking out in the dark that's why i got a headlamp for so i'll sit there and take pictures as long as possible yeah, enjoy the moment, right? I mean, you just harvested this animal you've been after forever, thinking about all year long. I mean, what is it to take a, a few extra minutes and then enjoy the experience? Exactly, exactly, which is why somebody needs to make that uh, that timer we were talking about on the camera to where 10 seconds take a picture, another 5 seconds it takes a picture. Oh, dude, I think that's your million-dollar idea. I've never seen that on any of these cameras. I think that's a great idea, right? And so you came up with this on the hike out, and you said, because most timers, they're 10 seconds, take one picture, or they're 10 seconds, and they take three right away too quick, and you're constantly walking back and forth to check the camera. Like you were saying, you came up with this idea where you'd set a camera up, it'd take a shot, and then 10 seconds would go by and it'd take another shot continuously so you could just keep tweaking and twisting that animal around to get the shot you want, right? Oh, it would make it so much easier for us. Oh, man, you got to get a hold of those programmers at Canyon, uh, Canon and Sony and get that through. That would be awesome. Yeah, they can take it. They, they don't have to pay me for it. I just want to use it. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's like me, too. Um so, yeah, no, that's super. I think those are some good tips on field photos and, and harvest photos on those things um, for sure. So, yeah, when so when we were on this Wyoming hunt, you also um, – oh, you talked about the different f-stop. You like to change the lighting on your camera. And so you play with your lighting quite a bit when you're taking pictures and, and taking video, right? 
yeah, I'm always I'm always messing with it. If it's not recording, I'm messing with it to try and find that. Just push it a little bit further than what I can. And so are you looking for less light, more light, or you're just looking for the perfect light for the shot you're taking? I'd say the perfect light for the, the shot I'm taking because sometimes it looks good with a little bit overexposed, and to me sometimes it looks good when it's a little underexposed. It just depends on how much – how much sun you have, if you want to catch the clouds in the background, then you're probably going to be a little bit more underexposed if it's a super bright day so that you can get that landscape in the background. And then sometimes you just need to have a little bit hot and so you can see what you want. And just For me, I'm, I'll go off from the meter a lot, but then I'll, I'll click it one way or the other just to whatever looks better to me. Okay, so you kind of know your settings and then you play with it as you're taking the pictures and you'll give it a little bit less light, a little bit more light for what it looks like on your display of your camera. And you do that taking harvest photos and taking support photos and your video, right? Yeah, everything. 100% of the time, I'm always messing with it. Okay, so so you mess and that's your f-stop, right, that controls that? Uh, it's my f-stop. Well, there's there's a couple different things. You got your ISO, which adds light. You have your f-stop, which is your focal range, and then you have your shutter speed. And all three of those, I'll be messing with. I, oh, okay. If I can so my you, ISO at 100 and not mess with that, I'll do that all day long. I usually only mess with that in low light settings because that's when the picture gets what they call busy. And I don't know if you've ever watched a video where there's a really super low light shot and you see almost like the bees on screen in the background, just everything moving. That's because their ISO is cranked way up. So that's the only thing I try not to mess with. But I'll mess with my shutter speed, my f-stop quite a bit. Okay. So, and you said ISO at 100 is what you like it at? Yeah, because that's the lowest that you can run it with on the, on most cameras. Okay. Um, I'm taking notes as I'm hearing this. This is a lot of information for me, too, because I'm all self-taught and self-learned. So this is great to be able to get this information from you. Um, so um, on this hunt, too, God, you showed up in really good shape and sounds like you keep yourself in really good shape. You um, you own a supplement company, right, or a couple different companies there in Colorado? Yeah, my twin brother and I have two stores, which is a part of a chain called Max Muscle. And uh -huh. what we do is nutrition, and then we have products like protein powders, uh, all kinds of stuff. We'll sell creatine, branch chain amino acids, glutamine, vitamins, joint support, just everything. And then nutri custom nutrition plans for people. But I'll tell you, man, I felt really out of shape following you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But I felt pretty out of shape for this season coming into it. With uh, My son is only 11 weeks old now, so I haven't been in the gym as much as I should have been. And I felt a little bad following you around. Oh, gotcha. No, you did great. Gosh, right. We covered a lot of miles in there. That pack out was further than I thought it was going to be. How many hours did we pack out of there? Mostly all downhill, too. Yeah, all, most by the first half hours uphill. And then after that, it was another four hours of just downhill. So I think we did pretty good, really. Yeah, and we did like a couple hours the night before getting the buck back to camp. So, um, yeah, we had to grind quite a bit in there with a 100-pound pack. Did you feel it at all the next day? Oh, dude, so I went I, – I told you to come with me, but I went and I sat in that river for as long as possible. And I actually – so as soon as I got down to the truck, Brian and I parted ways, and I went and I did my own ice bath in the in the river down there, and it was great. And I felt so much better the next day. I still felt the miles, but not nearly as much as if I hadn't done that ice bath, man. I, I probably sat in that river for 10 minutes, and it felt great. I was, I'd get in for a couple minutes and then get out for a minute and get back in, and I felt awesome, man. Uh, good for you. Yeah, you're tougher than I am sitting in that cold river like that. But I, yeah, I bet it did feel good. Oh, it, after the once uh, once my legs went numb after the first minute, it felt great. I'm not gonna lie, it was amazing. And I just yeah. felt so much better the next couple of days after that, knowing that I'd done it. And my, I, I think it really helped my muscles recover. I'll post that video later so you can watch me like, uh, I don't know, wincing like a little girl when I got into it there because it was pretty cold, but. <laughs> Well, I, I felt it the next day, if it makes you feel any better, too. I could feel those miles we put on, and, you know, I wasn't totally blown up, but I could definitely feel it. My muscles, my calves were a little bit sore in my hips and stuff. I could I could tell we packed 100 pounds out quite a few miles. Yep, 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 same here. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it, it helped, but it didn't make it go away, that's for sure. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so I wanted to get into a little bit of nutrition with you since you're so knowledgeable, you know, owning these couple stores with nutrition. And I was talking to you a little bit and I try to eat really clean and eat really well and I exercise a bunch, which is really good for me. 
Um, but I, I've never taken any supplements. You know, what do you think that that uh, that would benefit me and benefit some of the other guys out there? You know, on these long hunts or these endurance hunts, uh, or just in general, general health for us hunters out there. Well, I know one of the main things we talked about was getting enough protein. And you said you know that's something you're deficient in, in your diet, whether it's at home or on the mountain, and it's always it seems like it's the hardest thing to fit into your diet is protein. And so that's probably one of the main things that guys could benefit from is having more protein in their diet. And then whether it's from chicken, elk, or just uh, if last resort doing a protein shake. And up on the mountain for me, what I like to do for my breakfast is I'll pre-make a cup of granola and then a protein, a scoop of protein powder to kind of act as the milk. I mix some water in with it, and then I'm getting 40 grams of protein right off the bat. Whereas I know some guys when they're hunting have a hard time getting 50, and I'm getting almost that my first meal of the day oh man that's something i really gotta gotta take to heart and pick up on so i need to get some protein powder so protein powder you use like a whey powder and that's not as good as getting it from your food or um like from elk or chicken or something like that but like you say when you're in the mountains it's tough to cook up a steak when you're packed in 10 miles so you use like a whey protein is that right or you got what kind of powder do you like so what i like to use is a multi-source when i'm back there so it'll have five different types of protein in it it'll have an isolate protein uh two types of whey concentrate which is your normal whey protein and then a micellar casein and then a casinate protein, and both of those are slow digesting. So it actually stays with me for up to six hours. So I'm still eating in between then, but I still keep a really high nitrogen level with that protein digesting in my system and staying with me. And it really helps you push yourself a little bit further when you're back there, knowing that it's in your system and you don't get nearly as hungry as fast. Man, I'd say that's awesome. And so you sell that at your stores, right? And what was your store called again? Max Muscle. Max Muscle, okay. I have the ones in uh, Fort Collins and Loveland. And it's it's really been fun. My brother and I bought it back in December from a really good buddy of mine that we lived with. And he just got really busy with another business. And he kept one of the stores, and we bought two of them from him. It's been a, it's been fun. I definitely wouldn't tell people to do it to make money, but it's uh, <laughs> a good time so far. Uh, good for you. And so what's the best way that guys can get a hold of you? And then can they do like a consultation? Like I, I got good one-on-one -on -one time because we were in the mountains. And like I say, I'm going to hit you up on this this uh, five-source or multi-source protein powder I think is great. So how, what's the best way for guys to get a hold of you? Uh, they can always hit me up on either a phone call or a text message, or they can look up my store online and call the store and talk to them. But I'm always – if there's one thing I like talking about, it's hunting, but next to hunting, I like talking about nutrition and lifting and getting guys the help they want, and that's why I like having the stores. So they can either shoot me shoot me an email at r2lane at aol.com or just get me a, send me a phone call. They can go to my website and find my phone number on there too and stuff. And I got no problem talking to guys if they just even want to just text me, hey, I, I heard you. I want to talk to you about this. I, I, I really like helping guys get fit and stay in shape and be able to go back and do what they love back in the backcountry. Man, that's killer. And they can uh, probably look you up well, where I found you on Instagram as well. Probably send you a note on there as well, right? Well, Facebook, for me, I try to keep it a little bit I, a little bit more personal with my friends and stuff. So I got a ton of pending friend requests that I just I ignore instead of saying no to. <laughs> but on Instagram, yeah, they can send me a message on there. I never turn down a message on Instagram. So, And then yeah. another thing to follow up with that question, branch chain amino acids, I think, are probably one of the most underutilized things for guys – whether they're in the gym or hiking. Okay, say that again. What did you say it was? Uh, a what amino acid. Okay. And, and so basically protein broke down, ready to use by your muscles for fuel, and they make up 35% of your muscle structure anyway. And during a long, intense workout, like that pack out we're doing, instead of your body breaking down your muscles for fuel and using basically what's called going catabolic and using your own muscles as fuel, it's going to turn to these branch chain amino acids and use those for fuel and to repair during the hike out or during the workout. And so you're going to see a lot less fatigue, a lot less lactic acid buildup, and you're going to feel a lot better throughout the workout or throughout the pack out when you're using it. Um, uh, the first product that comes to mind other than just a pure branch chain amino acid is the wilderness athlete actually put some branch chain amino acids in their hydrate and recovery. Oh. Sorry, my phone is, uh, linked up to my computer. And says, yeah, 
no worries, same ring. I didn't know if it was mine or yours. I was looking at mine to try to answer it as well. <laughs> I got a great house from Hansky Archery calling me. I gotta, I'll call you back, Sean. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no worries at all. Um, no, that's great. So you would take this like right before a heavy workout, like a pack in or a pack out. Yeah, I actually would put it in with my drink. I'd, I'd drink it right before and then as much during as possible. It's kind of hard when you're in the backcountry where we were where we were really limited on our water intake and where we were getting the water. But when I'm elk hunting, I'm always putting a scoop of that into a shaker cup and just drinking it throughout the day so I have it with me. Okay. And is that something we get naturally through our foods and this just um, supplements that it's, or gives us – Yeah, it's uh, the best way to describe it. It's not the most scientific, but the best way to describe it is it's protein basically broke down by your system ready to use as fuel. So when you eat protein – it's going to get broke down to the leucine, isoleucine, and valine, which is the three branch chain amino acids that most supplement companies use. And it's just broken down already, ready for your body to use. And when you take a BCAA supplement in a powder form, you mix it up. When you drink it, it goes straight into the bloodstream instead of going through the digestive system. And actually, your body recognizes it and says, hey, we're putting this directly into the bloodstream. And we're going to start using it right away. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's great information and something I've, I've never even heard of or looked into. And so, God, I'm uh, so glad I met you and I'm able to, to use you for this information. Like I say, I'm going to be getting some of this stuff from you. And when we get off this podcast or whatever, I'll give you a shout and get some stuff ordered up. But I think that's great for guys. Yeah, thanks a bunch, Lane. Oh, yeah, no problem, man. Like I said, I, I, it's not as fun as hunting, but I love talking about it. It's my second best. So, <laughs> Yeah, good for you. Well, yeah, um, so you've got some good hunts coming up, and like I say, I, I think we'll, we'll start ending this thing, but you got some good hunts coming up, and I'd love to have you back on to see how your hunts went. you got a, a late-season mule deer tag you were telling me about too, right? You're really excited for yeah, it? Yeah, I'm really excited for that Nevada late-season tag. My buddy Dave Baronio told me to put in for it, and I got lucky and drew it with a low amount of points, and so I'm really excited to get out there. I don't know if I'm more excited about the hunt or just really excited to go out there and hang out with Dave because he's such a stand-up dude. And every chance I get to go hunt with him, I do. So. Oh, gotcha. Good for you guys. Or to, does he have, does he have that tag as well? No, he does not. With him being a resident, he didn't drop this year. And so it's just me. To have the tag, he's just already committed to, to helping me with it and to helping me tag out. So I'm, I'm really excited to go up there and hang out with Dave and, and get that hunt in. And it's nice having that late-season tag because – for me, usually my archery season ends the end of September. Now I'm like, hey, I still got all of December to go hunt. So, Oh, good for you. That's the way to do it. So, well, good. Yeah, so um, I'll be going to Alaska here, and you got your elk hunt coming up and then this late season hunt. But I'm going to keep in touch with you here and hear how you do. And I just want to thank you again for doing such a good job on the video side of things. I can't wait to show off what we did in there in the high country. And, and then I want to thank you again for being on the podcast and sharing your information on, on hunting and, and uh, also on, on fitness and supplements. I, I think it's really good information to put out there, Lane. So thanks again, man. Hey, any time, man. And uh, right back at you on that hunt, I had such a blast. And I learned so much from you on there on hunting those high country mule deer. The way your eye works, like, I think hunters are always constantly training their eye to pick stuff up. But, man, yours is crazy looking through that glass. We had the same power binos, and I'd swear you are using 15 buys. Because <laughs> you just pick out deer like no other, and then just your knowledge of it and everything up there, it was really awesome to be up there and learn from you, man. I can't wait for us to team up again. Yeah, well, sounds like a plan. We'll plan on it. So uh, uh, thanks again, Lane. And so uh, we'll just keep in touch and good luck on your hunts. Sounds great, man. Have fun in Alaska, dude. Be safe. Okay. Sounds like a plan.